blessed to be able to be back tonight and worship together. Um, so we got our, a couple of our youth coming in. I'm going to call them out as they come on in. Um, it is good to be with you tonight. Um, so I'm just going to open us with a word of prayer, and I'm going to let Taylor uh, lead us in worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, Lord. We pray that uh, you would be with us as we uh, worship together tonight, as we fellowship together, and Lord, but more importantly, as we open your word uh, and study your word about how to live a life that's pleasing to you. Uh, God, help us to go out throughout this week and do everything that we can to reach those who are lost and hurting for your kingdom. It's your name I pray. Amen. All right, if y'all would stand, we're going to start with, Lord, I lift your name on high. And that's basically what we're here to do today is lift the Lord's name on high together as a church family. So sing along. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My debt to pay From the cross to the grave From the grave to the sky Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. So as born-again believers, we have uh, assurance in the fact that we cannot earn our salvation, therefore we cannot lose it. Because if there's anything we could do to lose our salvation, we pretty much would. <laughs> so this song is um, kind of a testimony to that. If you're a Christian, then you can uh, sing this with assurance that uh, He will hold you fast. And that's pretty much the only way that we will get to the Father is through Jesus holding us towards Him. So sing if you know it. If you don't, then... Uh, just uh, read along to the lyrics. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast I could never keep my hold Through life's fearful path For my love is often cold He must hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. Those He saves are His delight, 
Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sign. He will hold me fast, he'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last, bought by him at such a cost. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is turned aside. When he comes at last, he will hold Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast, He will hold me fast, He will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. So most, if not all, of you know the old hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Uh, Ascend the Hill, a Christian band, redid a version of it, and it just adds a chorus into between the third and fourth verse. So um, sing along with me. Be my 
heaven's joys, O oh, bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Y'all can be seated. Taylor a chance to sneak by me real quick. All right. So nobody told me this morning that uh, they had heard that one this morning. I think everybody said that was a new one. So thank you for being polite and and not talking too bad about me as we left this morning. But. So our youth, we're starting a new discipleship series on Sunday mornings and Sunday night with our youth. And uh, so I'm just going to kind of carry on with what they've been talking about, uh, what they talked about in Sunday school this morning. Uh, so this will be kind of repetitive for them, but it'll be new for you. Um, so the title of tonight's uh, message is Discipleship Calls Us to Be Faithful Friends. And we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, if you want to go uh, go ahead and find that. So let me go ahead and read that passage right now. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together, and there was no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them. They came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like, like this with the within themselves and said to them, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take up your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he got up, took the mat, and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astonished and gave glory to God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, I come to you right now, and I thank you for all the blessings that you've done for us. Lord, I ask that you just speak through me tonight. Uh, let me uh, be uh, mindful in everything that I say, mindful that, that everything that I say brings honor and glory to you. And uh, Lord, just help me to, to use my words that, uh, that you've put on my heart to, uh, to speak to, to this group of believers tonight. It's your name I pray. Amen. So it's said that a circle of relationships can be thought to have four rings that are made up of different types of people. And you see those on there. If you can't read the, the little words, I didn't know how, how well those would be able to be seen up there. But we'll start from the outside and work our way in. But ourselves are the green circle in the middle of, of that ring. And the outermost circle, it says, are people we have professional relationships with. And these are <clears throat> people that we interact with in a professional manner uh, on a regular basis. It may be bank tellers or our dry cleaners, our restaurant servers, maybe your pastor. Um, the second circle coming inward uh, are people that you would consider to be acquaintances with. These are people that you have met a time or two and you've interacted with them on a more personal setting than just a professional manner. 
Uh, you know who they are when you see them, you speak, uh, but they're nothing more, it's nothing more than a surface level uh, interaction. These are kind of friends of friends, uh, classmates that you go to school with, maybe, or we went to school with, uh, but you weren't really friends in school. Maybe it's that Facebook friend that you added by mistake whenever you were doing some snooping out on their page and you're like, ooh, uh, well, I can't go back and delete it now. Um, so, I don't know. I might brother Tim up here. Y'all aren't getting my jokes tonight. <laughs> so the third ring coming in is our friends. That blue ring in there is our friends. Uh, they are the people that we interact with the most. Um, you know each other's personal situations. You share life together. Maybe it's our Sunday school members that we're together with co-workers that we work with, maybe it's parents of our kids' friends, maybe some extended family, that type of thing. And then the final ring, that yellow ring right outside of us, is our close friends and close family. These are the ones that are closest to us. They're the ones that we can count on the most. No matter what goes on in life, they're part of that event. Obviously, as these circles get closer and closer to us, they get smaller and smaller. The number of people within each circle also gets smaller and smaller. Um, there may be 20 or 30 professionals who we deal with on a, day, on a regular basis, but you know nothing more than the name tag on their shirt. But there may only be one or two that you consider to be your closest friends or your closest family. So I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about your circles of relationships especially those last two circles, those closest to you, your friends and your close friends. You may have friends who, you, who were once your friends or in your friend circle, but for whatever reason, they moved outside of that friend circle. There may be someone who was outside of that friend circle that has now become part of your friend circle. Depending on where you are in life, our circles of relationships, they tend to change. People can come in, in and out of our lives. They can float between those outer three circles kind of freely. But our inner circle, those closest friends and family, they're usually pretty consistent. It would take a lot of changes in your life for someone to come in or out of that inner circle. I want you to think about your, your inner circle right now. How many people would you say are in your inner circle Raise your hand if you have five or more people that you would consider in your inner circle. Okay, there's a bunch of you. There's a lot more of you than I really thought there were, uh, w thought there would be. So that is rare to me to have five people that you would think are in that inner circle of friends. Most of us would probably say we have between four, two and four within our inner circle. Um, how many of you would say you only have one person that's in that most inner circle? Nobody? Okay, which is good. I'm, I'm glad to see that we've all got more than just one, but sometimes we may only just have one person that's in our inner circle. Now I want you to consider your relationship with each person in that inner circle. I want you to think about how that relationship began. What started that relationship? Maybe it was all the way back in school and you've been friends since then. Maybe it's, hey, we met a couple of years ago and this is my person. It's probably your spouse if you're married. I would hope that your spouse is in your most inner circle. But I want you to consider the events that your friendship has endured. The hardships, the struggles, the fights, maybe the distance that you've lived apart from each other. All the things that you've had to go through and still they're in your inner circle. That person is still in your life. An inner circle of friends is a valuable asset that should not be treated lightly. They are friends who will walk through fire and move mountains to help us out. But I want to ask you this question. Does your inner circle of friends bring you closer to Jesus? That's what we need to think about when we think about that innermost circle of friends. Does our closest friends, do our closest family members, do they bring us closer to Jesus or they pull us away from Him? If you're someone else, if you're in someone else's circle, I want you to think about this. Do they bring, do you bring them closer to Jesus or do you push them away from Jesus? 
So tonight we're going to talk about this man and his friends that went to great lengths to get closer to Jesus. So the first thing I want us to think about when, with this group of friends, these four men that brought this man to Jesus, the first thing I want us to think about is faithful friends move us to Jesus. Now we obviously don't know the circumstances of this man being paralyzed. All we know is that by the time he and his friends heard that Jesus was in town and heard about the miracles that he had done in the past, there was already a huge crowd of people that had gathered. So much so that there, there was no way that they were going to get in to this home where Jesus was. So let's think about the process that these men had to go through in order to see Jesus. So it took four men to carry that one man. Now, we don't know how big of a man he was. I mean, he's probably, you know, average height, average build, maybe not even average build if he had been paralyzed for most of his life. He probably didn't have much body weight to him. But it took four of him, four, four men, to carry him on this mat, one at each corner. They had to carry him probably across town through crowded streets to get him from where he was to Jesus. Now they either had to hoist him up onto the roof or they had to go up some type of stairs to get him up to the roof. Now thinking, okay, this, this man, he's laying on this mat. He probably wasn't strapped down like we would think, you know, like on a gurney or something like that today. So, I mean, they had to be very careful to get him up there. This full-grown man that was nothing but dead weight. Then they had to dig a hole big enough in the roof of this home to drop him down into. And then they had to safely lower him down into that room in front of Jesus. Whew. That makes me tired just thinking about it. I mean, that's a lot of work. That is, that is a lot of work. That is huge dedication that it took from these friends to get this man to Jesus. Imagine the dedication and preparation that these men, these men had to go through for their friend. They had to plan and prepare for the task that was ahead of them. They had to make sure that the mat was sturdy enough for the trip. They had to have the right tools to open up the roof. They had to have the right equipment to get him safely up to the roof and down into the room. At any moment, one of these men could have said, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this. At any moment, one of them could have said, you know what, I'm just too tired. I can't, I can't keep going on like this. We, this, is, this is pointless. At any moment, one of them could have said that he didn't want the trouble of destroying someone else's property. But none of them did. None of these four men took any of those things into account that they didn't want to, that it was not worth the cost, that they were too tired, that they didn't want to worry with someone else's property. All they saw was their friend needed to get to Jesus. You see, true friendships are dedicated and prepared. They're dedicated to being there for each other no matter what events come about in life. They're prepared to either help in times of need or celebrate in times of joy. But more importantly, they are dedicated to seeing each other in a closer relationship with Jesus. They're prepared to do whatever it takes to see that relationship grow. Our inner circle of friends has to be the biggest impact on our lives. Their impact can either draw us closer to Jesus or pull us further away from Him. We must have friends in our lives who will do whatever it takes to see us grow in our relationship with God. It's got to be that close personal relationship with someone so that when they see us slipping away from God, they call us up and say, hey, I'm worried about you. Why don't we go to church? Why don't, why don't we pray together? We must also be friends who draw others closer to God as well. So the second thing I want us to think about is friendships and impact our faith. Notice in verse 5, it points out that Jesus saw the faith of these men. 
These four men would not allow anything to stop them from getting their friend to see Jesus. They had heard of the miracles that he had performed and they had faith that he could do the same for their friend. One thing that's kind of overlooked in this story until I started studying this a little bit more, but the faith of that one man. That one man had to, I mean, he couldn't go anywhere and all of a sudden here his friends are picking him up and toting him through town and putting him up on a roof and dropping him down. He had to have faith in his friends that they were going to do right by him, that they were going to take care of him during all of this. And then think about that moment that Jesus looked up at that roof and saw what was happening. He didn't scold or belittle these men for tearing up somebody else's property. He looked at these men and he realized their faith. He saw their faith that, that they wanted to have their friend brought to Jesus. He looked at this man and he didn't know. He looked at this man who he didn't know, but he called him son. He called the man son a term of relationship, a term of endearment. The faith that these men allowed their friend to be moved into a relationship with Jesus. Is that what your friends do for you? When you think about that inner circle of friends, are they friendships that are moving you closer to Jesus in everything that you do? You see, true friendships positively impact faith. Our friend circles should be so filled with people who positively impact our faith that there's not any room for those who negatively impact it. I've told our youth this a couple of times and over the last couple of years and I'll share it here tonight, but uh, as I was growing up, um, I graduated in a class of 52 from Carroll Academy and probably half of that class, when we graduated 12th grade, we started in kindergarten together. So most of those people I had known my entire life. And going through a school like that, there's obviously influences and, and people who, you know, who are popular and unpopular. And I was always kind of that unpopular, but I was right there on the border of of wanting to be in with that popular crowd. So I'd kind of do whatever I needed to do to hang out with them and, and be with them and, and whatever it took, even though I was the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth wheel in, in the group, so to speak. But after I got out of college, I mean, after I got out of high school, uh, went to college, and when we would go out, on weekends and things like that, I would always kind of hang out with that same group of friends and, and we'd be hanging out at somebody's field and everybody would be drinking and there'd all be all this kind of stuff. I never drank, but I was always associated with those people. And my parents would always be like, well, what'd y'all do tonight? Oh, we'd just hang out a little while. Well, what'd y'all do? I uh, just stood around. And my folks were always, you know, very serious about, Alan, you don't need to be hanging around with the wrong crowds of people. I was like, yeah, I know, but, you know, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, I, I, we, we understand. We trust you. But you need to be careful who you hang out with. I was like, I understand. So this, you know, every time I'd come home on the weekends, we'd kind of get together and hang out and stuff. And this whole time, my folks were back and forth with me. And I, it never really... Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. So anyway, Thanksgiving week of my freshman year of college rolls around. I come home from school that day or that week, and um, we had a Wednesday night youth service. It was a progressive supper, and at the very last stop of that supper, we had a devotion. And our, my, my youth minister at that time, he gave an illustration. I don't remember what the full talk was about, but he gave the illustration that... Um, Something along the lines that if I go into the gas station and I buy a Coke and they wrap it up in that nice little brown bag and you see me walking out of this one particular gas station with this one little brown bag, what are you going to think? 
I'm like, well, I don't know. What's that? It's an <laughs> that's right. So that's the first thing that comes to your mind. It's not a Coke, right? Even though it may be a Coke. And even though my parents had been telling me the same thing, when he said it, it clicked. And that Wednesday night, it clicked. And when he said that, he went into a little bit more elaboration about things like that. And, and I went home that night and went through Thanksgiving Day and Friday night, called up my friends, said, hey, what are y'all doing? Well, we're going to so-and-so's. All right, I'll be there. So I drive my truck, and we're hanging out and the whole night. I'm just kind of mulling that conversation over in the back of my head. Couldn't get it out of my mind for anything. And there was always this one guy. He was several years older than us that he'd hang out. He was dating one of the girls that I graduated with, and he'd always hang out with us. And every weekend, same thing. Hey, Alan, you want a beer tonight? I'm good. I'm good. All right, I'll catch you next week. Okay. So this one night, here he comes. Hey, Alan, you want a beer tonight? No, I'm good. And, I, I'm, and it was just like this weight was on me. It was nothing that I had, like I'd ever felt before. And after about five minutes after he approached me and asked me that, I said, you know what, I got to go. And I told a couple of my friends by that, that were home from, from other colleges that I hadn't seen you know, in a while. I told them by and I, and I got in my truck, cranked up, and as soon as I pulled out of the driveway of that, of that field, it was like a weight had been lifted off of me. And I knew at that moment, God was telling me, Alan, I don't want you associated with this. And that was the hardest drive home that I have ever had because I had to have this conversation with God. God, those are my friends. God, those are the people that I've known all my life. What am I supposed to do? How, I mean, who am I going to hang out with? And it was just, I'll provide. I'll be there. And from that moment on, it's not that I, I shunned my friends. It's not that I unfriended them, so to speak. But I had to be very careful with, with my interactions with them. I had to be careful when, when I interacted with them and what that interaction looked like. I had to replace that group of friends. The following year, I got involved in BSU, and, and now to this day... Those friends that I met in that year are my inner circle. When we do what God tells us to do, when we make sure our friend circle are the ones that are drawing us near to God instead of pulling us away, He's going to bless us. He's going to do the things that, that He's called us to do. The third thing is Jesus meets our needs. So after Jesus established this personal relationship with this man, he proceeds to offer him forgiveness. Now, we know from other stories in the Bible that not all physical ailments are the result of a sinful life, but it's apparent in this situation that that may have been the case. Jesus knew that the most important healing that this man needed at that moment was the healing of his soul. He looked past his physical need and saw his spiritual need. So many times in life, we've been hurt or physically or emotionally beaten down. And while we may come to Jesus for physical healing, we need to understand that in order for us to be physically healed, there must be some spiritual healing that needs to go on first. He wants to provide for our every need, but we have to come to Him in faith and the expectation that He will be there for us. And fourth and finally, God's work results in God's glory. Obviously, there were those in the crowd who were upset at the words that Jesus spoke. The act of forgiving sin is only something that God can do, and, and the idea that anyone else can do that is blasphemy. 
It's blasphemy for us today to, to think that. So they were not wrong in their thinking that, that this claim was blasphemous except for the fact of who said it. Jesus knew what they were thinking and, and he called them out. He asked a simple question. Is it easier for me to say that sins are forgiven or for physical healing to take place? By saying this and then healing the man, Jesus revealed that he had the power to do both. He had the power to both heal the man spiritually and heal him physically. These people who witnessed this event were amazed and left praising and glory, giving God glory. So when we look at this whole event from start to finish, we know that Jesus knows everything that's going to take place. And we know that, that as He sat in that home filled with all these people, He knew when those men left the home. He knew as they were going through the streets. He knew as they were getting their friend up on that roof. And He knew what was happening when they started breaking into the roof. And He knew all of it was going to bring glory to God. But it all started with the faith of the men who brought their friend to Jesus. You see, true discipleship calls us to be faithful friends. If we're going to be a true follower of Christ, like we talked about this morning, and be His disciples, then we must be faithful friends, and we must have a friend group of faithful friends that are going to bring each other closer to Jesus. If our friend circles are filled with people who constantly pull us away from Jesus, then they're not the influence that we need to, to have. Now, like I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with being friends with people who are not saved. But we've got to be careful how they influence us. We've got to make sure that their influence doesn't impact our relationship with God. Now we can say, well, I, I want to be a friend to this person and they're not saved because I want to pull them up to Jesus. But it's a whole lot easier for them to pull us down than for us to pull them up. Because sin, falling into the temptation of sin is so much easier than trying to pull somebody else out of it. We need to make sure that those influencers in our life are replaced with those that are going to do whatever it takes to draw us closer to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You again for this day. God, I pray that as we strive to be disciples of Yours, that we will look at our friend groups, those that are closest to us, those in our inner circle, and God, I pray that we evaluate those friendships and say, yes, that person brings me closer to Jesus. Yes, that person... Uh, helps me when I'm down. But God, help us to always also say, God, no, this person does not bring me closer to you. God, this person keeps pulling me further and further away from you. And help us realize, as difficult as it may be, sometimes that inner circle of friends needs to be evaluated and changed, all to glorify you. God, I pray for each person in this room tonight, each person that's hearing me on uh, uh, on the internet, Lord, I just pray that you would just allow us to be godly disciples of yours in every step that we take this week. And we will look at our friends and we will be the kinds of friends who draw each other to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Have a good week.